Church. Is it a building, a service, an organisation, a community of people? What does church mean to you? Recently I've been prompted to go back to basics, to look again at the blueprint for the early church. And for me it's raised loads of questions. What did Jesus really mean when he said, I will build my church? What were the building blocks for the early church, that time of a new way, a new following? And are we still replicating them today? You know, I have the opportunity to speak with lots of people about faith and church. And sometimes I'm left wondering if we have become attenders of the church rather than seeing ourselves as the church. You know, I think if we've become attenders, then I think this is time for change. This is the time to see ourselves as God sees us. This is time to see in a new way all that God wants for us in this exciting, driven, purposeful life where he sees us as a valued and important part of his church. Church is not for spectators. Church is a community of people rolling up their sleeves, looking at the blueprint and playing their part. Hey, good morning, everyone. Really, really good to see if you're watching online. Welcome to you, too. Um, it was this weekend, 27 years ago, that this church began. Uh, it was in Mendelsham Community Centre. There were 30 people. We had six guests arriving on that first uh, day, and it was an incredibly exciting time. And uh, looking back over the last 27 years of uh, The Forge, uh, there have been some incredible highs uh, where um, I have just, yeah, absolutely loved it. And there have also been some incredible lows too. And I guess that's the story of our lives, isn't it? That our, our lives are kind of highs and lows and, and bits in between too. And that's certainly been uh, my experience and I think our experience uh, as a church community. And what was so exciting going back in, um, to 1992 was that it gave us a chance to start again. It gave us a chance to have a kind of a fresh start because I'd grown up in a little brethren church. And so church for me as a child was going along to a service at 11 o'clock in this little tin hut of a gospel hall where there was what was known as the breaking of bread service. And the breaking of bread service meant that anyone could take part at any point during that hour. So you could choose a hymn, you could say a prayer, you could do a reading. And then at a certain point, someone would then get up and uh, we would then share communion together. Together. So that went from 11 till 12. We'd then shoot home because my mum always did a roast meal on a Sunday. It's part of the Bible. I don't know if you realise that. but um, uh, So anyway, so we always went home for a roast meal. How she managed to do this, I don't know. And then by half past one, we then had to be back at this little chapel again because it was Sunday school. Uh, and so we would then have the hour of Sunday school. Uh, kids would be dropped off back home again. And we would then go into our afternoon service. So then we would have our afternoon service and basically church was done by about four o'clock. So, so that was the regular, that was my experience of church. On a Monday, we used to have a kids club and a youth club that I grew up going to and being a part of. And, um, and on a Wednesday evening, it was the prayer meeting. Now, as a child, I didn't used to have to go to that one. I was let off at the prayer meeting. Um, occasionally we would have these visiting speakers who would do Bible teaching sessions too. And so that was my experience of church uh, it, growing up. It was quite traditional. It felt now, looking back, very kind of old-fashioned. But actually it was the environment that actually I came to faith. And it was the environment where when I'd learnt three chords, I got on my guitar and I sang whatever songs that I could do uh, uh, in the church service. When I was 11 or 12, I was able to teach Sunday school. It was my first opportunity to do what I'm doing now, which is speaking in public. And so it gave me all kinds of opportunities. So when we started um, what was known as Mendelssohn Christian Fellowship, it gave us the chance to say, what's really important to keep and what can we let go of? What's the tradition that's just kind of always been going on, that we can break? And what new things should we start to do? 
And as I said, it has been the most uh, incredible time of my life over these last 27 years. And some of you here have done the journey all those 27 years. Some of you have come in uh, as the years have gone on. Some of you will be very new. But I just want to say how grateful I am uh, that, that we can do a journey of faith together, whether it's still trying to explore faith or, or whether it's that we've found a faith in Jesus and we're looking to uh, encourage and grow each other. So I just want to say thank you uh, so much for that. Because everybody, I think, will have some experience or some kind of um, view on church. So I would talk to some people and they would say that church is like my family. Others would say that church really hurt me. Some would say that church, I just love gathering together. Others say it's the most boring place they've ever been. How can, how can it be a place? How can it be a service? How can it be a community? Church, just, there's so many connotations when it comes to this word church. And we all view it in very different ways. And so Helen got the choice for what we were going to look at over these two weeks, this kind of mini series that we're doing, because there are different um, themes in different locations. And so she chose the church. So what does Jesus have to say about the church? What is the church or who is the church? That's what I want us to think about this week. Next week, we're going to try and look at what's our part within the church. But this week, who is the church? Well, church was first mentioned in a place called Caesarea Philippi. That's the first time that Jesus is recorded, should I say, that Jesus ever used the word church. Caesarea Philippi was a town and it became a very important town because when Herod... Herod the Great, who was the king when Jesus was born, uh, he was given this town by Caesar Augustus as a way of saying thank you for his loyalty to the Roman Empire. But it was also a place where some weird worship went on. And it was worship to the goat god called Pan. And so people had built temples. In fact, um, in August... I went to visit this place because I was able to go out to the Holy Land. Here we go. Look, this is a little photograph of, uh, of what it looks like um, now. Uh, and and this, this place at Caesarea Philippi, this is where the pan god was worshipped. And so they built this temple and, uh, where they would make sacrifices. And uh, next to the temple, there was like this court that they had built where all kinds of uh, weird sexual acts with goats would take place during their goat worship experiences. And as you can see there, there is like this cave that comes, uh, that, that's there. That's where the animals used to be thrown when they were sacrificed. But it was also the place where they believed that the spirits would come to earth from hell and go backwards and forwards again. That's what they believed. And so that cave, that area that you see there, was known as the gates of hell. So it's a really, really weird place that Jesus should take his disciples to ask them a really, really important question. This is um, uh, what... Uh, happened. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? That was the name that he used for himself. Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. In other words, that God's kind of brought these people back again in order to get vengeance. But then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied almost immediately, he says, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You didn't learn this from any human being. Now, I say to you that you are Peter. He was known as Simon Peter. Jesus gave him this nickname, Peter, which means the rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the gates of hell will not conquer it. In other words, when Jesus first used this term that we would um, uh, use as church, it was used in terms of a prediction that he was going to build this thing called church and nothing was going to get in its way. 
And so do you see, 2,000 years later, us gathering together today uh, and places all over the UK and all over the world, we are fulfilling those very words that Jesus said. He predicted us. Isn't that interesting? That he predicted us 2,000 years ago. And the foundation on which this thing called church, which we'll come on to in just a moment, the rock on which everything, would, everything else would be built from, would be the inspired statement that Peter made regarding Jesus' identity. What did he say? That you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And so he uses, Jesus uses this clever word play. And he says, um, Simon, you're going to be called Peter, which means the rock. And on this rock, in other words, on what it is that you have said about me, the church is going to be built. And 2,000 years later, that is probably the only unifying thing in churches today, that a church would believe in who Jesus is, that he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The church is split and divided over just everything else. But on the whole, that's the one thing that we have stayed united over. And Jesus asked these disciples the question, who am I? And that is still the central question that every single one of us has to be able to come to an answer about. Who is Jesus? I love being involved in the Alpha course and the second session of the Alpha course just asks that question, who is Jesus? And we look at his life and his death and his resurrection. And it calls for people to say, come on, who is Jesus? Because that defines everything else in life. You know, for me, recognizing who Jesus is has shaped my decisions in life. It's shaped my attitudes. It's shaped, um, it shaped my job. I mean, this is why I do what I do, because of who I believe Jesus to be. And church, the problem is, is that church has this incredibly religious connotation to it, doesn't it? You mention church to anyone, I go, oh, religion, don't like religion. Uh, and they kind of take that step back because they don't like church. Actually, the term that Jesus used for church wasn't church. Did you know that? He didn't actually use the word church, not just because he was speaking in a different language. He used a different word. And the word was this. It was called ecclesia. And ecclesia basically means a gathering together of people for a specific purpose. But that wasn't a religious term. That was just for whenever. So Ipswich supporters or Norwich supporters, when they gather together, it's known as an ecclesia. Well, Norwich is known as a waste of time, but, um, but, but you understand what I'm getting at, don't you, yeah? So soldiers gathering together to fight. It's known as an ecclesia. It's a gathering of people for a specific person, or for a purpose, I mean. And so when Jesus used this term, what he was saying was this, that I am going to build my own gathering, my own community of people, and the foundation of this community is me. That's what he's saying, because it's on the declaration of Peter that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's the foundation. Basically, everything else of this community works from the fact that Jesus is who he claimed to be, which is God himself. And so over the three years that Jesus was ministering to people, uh, he taught about what this new community, this new gathering of people built around him what that community would look like. And so he would teach people, and, and he, would, he would say, Laurie, you've got to love one another. Uh, and he would look around and he'd say, Trevor, you've got to forgive others. Uh, and, and he would teach, and he would say, Penny, you, you have to disciple people. You've got to make disciples. You've got to live it out and teach others to live my way. And he would say, Kev, you've got to serve one another. And so much of what Jesus taught was about building towards what this new community would look like. But it wasn't Jesus' teaching that started the church as we know it. 
Great though Jesus' teaching was, it wasn't the teaching that started the church. It was started because of an event that took place and an event that was so profound, so unexpected, so revolutionary that it turned the first Christians or first followers of Jesus, it turned their lives upside down. Because what had happened is that they had seen Jesus at the end of his three years being arrested and flogged and tried and crucified. And they had no thought at that point whatsoever of being a community that is built on Jesus because all of their hopes had gone. Because this Jesus who they were going to build the community on was there hanging on a cross dead. And so their lives were utterly shattered. And then it happened, which was three days later, Jesus appears to some of his followers. And over the next 40 days, he appears to over 500 people. 500 people see Jesus alive again. And they eat with him, and they touch him, and they talk with him. And Jesus tells them to go and make disciples of all nations, and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he leaves them. But before he leaves them, he tells them to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. In other words, he was saying that my presence is going to come on you in a very different way. So 40 days after the resurrection, the group of Jesus' followers are gathered in a room and the Holy Spirit comes upon each one of them. And Luke, who's writing, who's got the story from the disciples who were there, he writes and he says what they saw was as if there were these flames of fire coming down on each person. And then there was, in the room, there was this sound like this mighty wind, as if there was going to be a movement somehow. And there was going to be a movement. It was called the Jesus movement, which would start to spread out and affect the whole world. And the disciples who had been filled with the Holy Spirit, they then started a talk. And as they talked, people with other nationalities could hear them speaking in their own language. And they were saying, what's going on? And so Peter steps forward on the day of Pentecost and he preaches this incredible sermon about Jesus. And his sermon can be summed up in four phrases. This is what he told the people there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. He said this, you killed him. God raised him, we've seen him, now say you're sorry. That's what he did. If you read his long, long sermon, that's basically what he was saying. That you killed this Jesus, the Messiah, you killed him, but God raised him, and we've seen him, now you say you're sorry. This is how it's recorded by Luke. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. And Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you, to your children, and to those far away. In other words, those who aren't Jews, the people anywhere and everywhere. All who have been called by the Lord our God. And then look at this. Those who believed what Peter said were baptised and added to the church that day. About 3,000 in all. And from that point on, Jesus' words when he says, I'm going to build my church. It's going to be built on who I am. And there's going to be nothing, not even the gates of hell, that place in Caesarea Philippi where these demons and spirits are supposed to come and go. Not even that is going to prevent this from happening. And there on the day of Pentecost, over 3,000 people came to faith. And it grew and it grew as people who were so motivated by their faith because they had seen Jesus They had seen the risen Jesus. They couldn't stay quiet about it. And so more and more people came to be part of this community. And do you realise that 2,000 years later, in the year 2019, the church is stronger than it's ever been? Now, not necessarily in this country, but around the world, it is the strongest that it has ever been. I, I just saw this the other day. 2,400 million Christians in the world today. 
Do you know what? In Africa, in the, at the beginning of the um, 20th century, there were estimated to, to be 10 million Christians in Africa. There are now 360 million Christians in Africa. Did you know that China, China has about 100 million Christians, and so many of those are young people. And it's exploding. China will soon become a Christian nation. There are so many Christians living there. Do you see how this explosion has taken place? And whereas the church should easily have been crushed, even within the first few years, what Jesus said is that I'm going to build my church and nothing's going to stop it. This has been happening and happening and happening all around the world. See, if you ever feel like you're the only Christian, you're the only follower of Jesus uh, because it's really hard at work or in your family, you have to know that there are just millions of others who are doing the same struggle, doing the same walk as you, of working out what it means to follow Jesus. So what did the early church look like? What did those Christians do? What was happening? Well, fortunately... Luke records it. This is what he says. In in my Bible, it has a heading which says, the believers form a community or a gathering. This is what it says. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. So as Luke is writing down what he's seeing, he is seeing what is the most beautiful community. It's the community that every single one of us would want to run after. Because it's so diverse in in age, it's diverse in backgrounds, in the social economic system as well. The church was just made up of such a diverse bunch of people. And of course it would be, because Jesus called a diverse bunch of people. He called um, Simon the Zealot, who was out to kill the Romans and to stop everything the Romans was doing, and Matthew, who worked for the Romans. So imagine the arguments that must have gone on for them as they tried to follow Jesus and yet hated each other, you know? It's, it's How does that work? But what Jesus was doing was bringing these different people together and teaching them how to love each other. And so the apostles' teaching was based on what Jesus had taught. They weren't making it up. They they were just teaching what they'd heard Jesus teach. Jesus hadn't gone through life on his own, but he'd built a community, a community that he could lean into as well as who he could disciple. So they became a community that they could lean into and so that they could disciple. Food was central to the community. Communion was a meal that was established by Jesus. It was reshaping the Passover meal. So what they were doing was reflecting what they had seen Jesus do. Prayer was at the heart of everything. And the power of Jesus was working through them. So people were being healed and other miracles were taking place. They still believed that Jesus could do those things. And then he goes on to say this. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Suddenly being part of this new community meant that stuff didn't have the value in the same way. You have a need, let me sell something so I can meet your need. It was beautiful. They weren't coerced to do it. They just did it because they were a community. They wanted to support each other. That suddenly justice played such an important part. If I have so much and you have so little, how is that fair? How is that just? What can I do to start to put that right? And all the while, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Do you see how life changed for these followers? The resurrection of Jesus had just changed everything for them. And they devoted their lives to following Jesus, but not doing that separately. They chose to do it together. It wasn't an optional extra. It wasn't whether I feel like it or not. 
It wasn't a half-hearted thing. It became part of their everyday life, that they were in community with others. So Helen asked if I would um, speak in order to go back to what was the blueprint for the church and for his early followers. Uh, And then how do we match up? (laughs) How do I match up? I tell you, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've made that, uh, if you've accepted the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, he is God who came to earth, then you're the church. You are the people that make up the church. But you also need to be connected into the life of the church. God never called people to go it alone. He always called people into community because God is a God of community. And so is doing this faith journey together a priority for us or is it an optional extra if we feel like it, if we're not doing something else? Honestly, it was a challenge as I was going through this. Where is my faith to still pray in Jesus' name for miracles to happen? Or has that all kind of drifted off and fallen off? Just coming back to this raises a passion in me to say, now God had something more in store for me, in store for you, in store for us as a church community. So I just want to go over four things that um, uh, that early church picked up really quickly. Number one, it said that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You flip that around and let me ask you the question, who are you learning faith with? Because these people were learners. And are you a proactive learner? Are you hungry to know God better? Are you hungry to find out what he wants for your life? If so, honestly, what are you doing about it? Because this learning was done within the early church and it was done together. Because when you learn together, you can encourage each other on. You can push each other. You can hold each other to account. So let me ask you the question, who is pushing you to go deeper in faith? Who have you allowed in to ask that question and to ask those questions of you? Are you growing? Are you learning? And if you can't answer that, then honestly, I just want to ask, or I want to say that therefore something needs to change, that we need to do something about it. Because we are the church and we're called to learn together. So make the most of running mates, make the most of 10-month groups, make the most of Sundays, make the most of podcasts, make the most of listening to talks online. Be a proactive learner because it's called being a disciple because a disciple is a learner. So who are we learning faith with? Secondly, who are you doing life with? Because they committed life to the fellowship. In other words, they invested in each other's lives. They opened up their lives for others to have influence with. And it struck me, who who knows me well? And who do I know well? Who, who, Who do I invest in? And let me ask you the question, who really knows you well? Outside of your marriage or outside of your immediate family, who really knows you well? And who are you investing in? I tell you, we live in a culture where our homes uh, are our castle. And so when we get in from work, it's just lovely to be able to close the door, to shut the world out, uh, and we can just um, uh, relax and do whatever we want in our home. But that's not doing life together. That's cutting ourselves off. So who can we do life together? With. It's why we established 10 month groups to start with, or small groups to start with. It was to help with that, to help people be connected with one another. So, who are you doing life with? Who are you learning faith with? Thirdly, who are you sharing meals with? Just thought I'd mention that one. <laughs> Do you know what? Hospitality should be one of the key marks, hallmarks of people of faith because it's extending kindness and it shows values to others. Do you know what? I am convinced more and more that in the fast pace of life that you and I live, um, uh, to slow down and to eat meals with friends or, or with, um, uh, with others is such an important thing to do because we're creating time just to be together. 
So, when did you last invite people around for a meal? And if you can't answer that, maybe you need to do something about it. Don't just go for friends, look wider, look wider. Finally, who are you praying with? Remember they devoted themselves to prayer? Now to pray with someone, I know is really, really hard. It's tough, but I tell you, it can be the making of your walk with Jesus if you're willing to pray with others. It is. It makes you feel incredibly vulnerable. It makes you think, I don't know what to say. And so you're going to have to trust on God all the more of working out how it is that you should pray. Prayer is this direct conversation with God. It's, it's showing our dependence on God. So are you creating time to pray? But are you creating time to pray with others in friendships? And if you can't answer that, then maybe you need to do something about it. So this week... Just have a look at this. Have a look what's up there on the screen. What step can you take to learn with someone this week or to do life with someone this week or to eat with or to pray with others? What one step can you take? Because you can listen, you can agree and do nothing. And that's foolish. So come on, just have a look at that list. Which one? This week... Could you proactively step out to say that I want to model something of what Jesus called us to model? To learn with, do life, share meals. And when you've thought of that something, I want you to ask that you stand. So if you've got something in mind already, could could I ask that you stand? This is still going back to what Jesus called us to be as a community, the church, the ecclesia, the gathering of people with a purpose. Let me pray for you, Father. I pray that um, you would help us to live out the blueprint that you set out for what church can be, of a gathering of people, a community of people who serve and love and share life together, who grow together. Lord, for whatever it is that you've put in our minds, would you help us to act on that now, on this this week? Would you give us the courage to not just listen, but to do what it is that you've prompted us to do? In Jesus' name, amen. Can I ask the rest of us stand, please? We're going to do something. We can choose to do something which the early church did, and that is to share communion together. So the band are going to lead us in our final song. And as we sing this song, I just want to encourage you, there, are, uh, there is a place with uh, bread and wine down here and here, and there are two at the back as well. And just to come forward, and it's that reminder of what Christ has done for us, of giving his life for us. But the bread, his body broken, the cup, his blood which is shed for us. They worshiped together in the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. So let's share bread and wine together as we sing, what a wonderful name is the name of Jesus.